Okay, hi, welcome. This is um, Friday Photoshop the afternoon edition with me, Phil, the um, Photoshop rendering guy. Welcome. If you were here for this morning's Photoshop session, you will perhaps, wait a sec, let me just click the button. It's just me talking, we don't need that. You might not find today like super edifying if you were here um, this morning. We're going to be going through uh, the same sort of series of techniques that we went through this morning. It's just the same project. The reason why I'm doing it again is because um, <laughs> the, the way that it worked when I was at university um, and we're actually on site was that we'd have two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And I want to try and keep everything the same so that you guys who are now not on site perhaps or watching this from wherever, the comfort of your cave, will be able to sort of organize your day, hopefully be able to find it useful. Now, there is, of course, because we did the session this morning, YouTube's recorded that and that session still exists. If you want to watch that instead, you watch it in your own time, it's entirely up to you. The benefit of watching live is that you guys can join in if you get on the chat on YouTube or if you are on Discord, then you can follow along and if any part of what I'm saying or doing doesn't really make sense, which is quite likely because my brain is complete mush at the moment, then you can ask the question live and I can hopefully show what the solution is. Now, if you are following along afterwards, hi from the past. I hope that the future is teaching you, uh, treating you well. If you've got a question about any of what I'm saying, whilst I'm saying it, obviously um, I can't see into the future and answer immediately. But if you leave a comment down in the comments here on the YouTube page, then I'll be able to help you hopefully drop into the comments and answer the question. Um, but other than that, let's just get straight into it. The way that I recommend you guys work is that you take me here on YouTube and you put me onto your phone or your second screen on your tablet. Or if you've got a fancy double monitor set up like me, then you can um, have one on one and one on the other. I want you to guys have Photoshop open on your main computer so that you can follow along. The goal for this is not just for you to watch and be like, oh, I get it, but for you to be able to actually follow along step by step. So I recommend that you have YouTube open simultaneously so you can watch and then you can follow along as we go along. Now, because we're going to be um, producing a render based on a particular image, what I recommend is that you guys download that image. If you are on YouTube and you look in the description, just here, you're going to have to click the little arrow so that it goes into the description. I've got um, a G drive which links to, um, uh, what's the word, the links to a particular file. So the file that I've got, let me just click here, is this. It's called sensordevice.jpg. It isn't anything in particular. It's literally just um, an old sketch that I've got of a particular device. And we're going to be going through sort of the render method that I've been teaching at the university creating, um, using the pen and the path tool, creating masks, building layers based on the individual surfaces of the object, and then using the airbrush technique to sort of render that so that you get a really nice finalized finished looking piece at the end. I think the, the one that we did this morning, I might have done it in a slightly roundabout way, but it ended up looking really nice. I was happy with how it came out at the end. Whether, <laughs> whether anyone's able to reproduce that or not, I've no idea. I don't think, I'm not sure that anybody this morning was, um, was following along live. So I've not been able to uh, get any feedback from anybody who's actually attempted to do it. None of the techniques that we're gonna use are especially complicated. Uh, oh, are they? Not really. Um, but I must admit that I was <laughs> saying that from a position of having done this particular project a few different times to demonstrate. So ideally you guys will download this file get it open on Photoshop and then we can get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, I'm just going to sit here and tread water for a minute whilst you um, see if you can get that file. I can see that there's a, there's only a few people watching at the moment. So realistically, probably just need to plow on. So here we go. We've got our file open in Photoshop. Anytime you open a JPEG like this into Photoshop, here we've got the layers on the right hand side. You see by default, it will say background in italics and it'll have a little lock by the side of it. That means that this is the base layer of a series of layers. We want it to be 
like the top layer. The way that I'm going to teach you guys to work, the way that I always recommend working, is that the uh, sketch, if you're bringing in an analog sketch like this, the actual pen line's always at the very top of the layers. And then we're going to work with everything else underneath those layers. So in order to be able to do that, you need to pop this out from the background. So the way that you do that is just click on the lock, and it will say, instead of background, you see now it says layer zero. So what I want you to do now is we're going to rename that. Now you will detect a theme if you watch enough of my videos or if you've been in my classes that I recommend that you name everything in terms of layers, when you're working with pass sets, when you're naming your documents, if you're going to create a new file. The reason is not just so that you can like activate the OCD part of your brain and feel like you've accomplished something, but because when you're working in a professional environment, oftentimes the files that you create are going to be used by other people. So when I make a document, I know how it's built, I know exactly what happened, I can mentally walk through exactly how I constructed it. I don't need to name the layers, but the reality is that if I was working in a commercial setting and I needed to then send that to somebody or like somebody comes in like, Phil, we need you on this project, can you hand that file over to this person so they can finish it off or they need to take a few pieces out so that they can integrate them into their project. If they open my file up, and it's got like a hundred layers, and they're all like layer one, layer one copy, layer one copy two, layer one copy three, layer two, layer two copy, layer copy two A, then they're not gonna be my best friend. So make sure that you name all of your layers. I'm gonna name this layer Sketch. It's very easy. Hopefully you can see what I was going for with that. It just has to make sense. In order to make sure that we can work underneath this, because we're gonna be able to uh, create layers underneath, what we're going to do is we're going to set the transparency of this layer to multiply. So we're just here, multiply, fourth down from the top. So now, if we create um, a layers underneath, the way that that works with multiply is that the black lines are going to be sort of opaque. You can see those. Everything that's pure white in the document is going to be transparent. Now, normally, you guys at university know that when I bring a document into the file like this, that we've taken a scan of, or if I've used my phone to take a picture of, it's usually pretty rubbish and then we have to go through this process of making sure that it's as clean as possible to work from. For today, we're gonna to be working on this perfect document. If you guys aren't familiar with how to clean a document up when you bring a sketch in, have a look at some of my other YouTube videos because we go through the same process in all of those to make sure that we're working from a very consistent baseline. So we're all working on the same um, from the same position. Every time you bring a sketch in, it's always working from the same position. So I've already done this with this and the file that you guys are downloading. The white of the page is pure white. The black lines, although they are messy, are pure black, so we're going to be able to work nicely with this. It may be when you guys are working in Photoshop that you've got your layers, channels, and paths like this. We're going to be swapping between layers and paths. So what I want you guys to do is to click on the paths, the little paths tab, pull it out, drag it down to the bottom, and you'll see here we've got this little blue line appears. And that blue line means that when I let go, ting, it's going to nest this path down at the bottom. Let me just push this up. When you're working in Photoshop, you always want to, and to be honest, any app that you're working in, if you're an illustrator, in design, if you're working in CAD, anything like this, you need to make sure that the um, environment that you're working in is set up for what you're going to be doing. Well, Photoshop is a really great program. It can do a lot of different things, and it can work in lots of different ways. And often there'll be windows and stuff that it can open for you that would be useful if you were working one way, but if you're working in a different way, they're just taking up space on the page. So because, for example, what we're doing today doesn't involve any text, I've not got any of the text windows open. By default, a lot of the time when you open Photoshop up, over on the, um, the right-hand side of the window, it will have like a, an entire column which is given over to the um, library system for Adobe CC. But I'm not using that for this. I actually don't really use it for anything at the moment. So it just doesn't, it's not on the page. If you've got your libraries open and you're not using them, like, a, a bigger monitor costs more than a smaller monitor, right? So if you've got a bigger monitor and a load of that space is being taken up by something not, you're not using, that window is costing you money, right? You might as well have bought a smaller monitor. You could have saved some money. So having that little bit of libraries down the side, if you're not setting your artwork or your space up to maximize how big you can work, then not only are you like making life difficult for yourself because everything's gonna be smaller, is like it's literally costing you money for the reason I've just outlined, which is a great metaphor. And I'm gonna remember that next time I need to badger someone about it. So here we are. I'm gonna click P. 
and we're going to make a new path set. So the way that this render system works is that we're going to break down the object into all of its sort of constituent separate surfaces. And we're going to create a mask, a path for all of each of the different surfaces. So let's say this top flat bit, the screen, this inset section, the side, this grip just here. Um, and we're going to use the path tool to do that. Now, the reason why we're going to use the path tool is it creates incredibly accurate lines, incredibly accurate masks. And what we're aiming for with this is to create a piece of artwork that is more accurate and tidier, which isn't that hard, but tidier than this crappy sketch. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to trace around the outline of this sort of flat top surface. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to have to sort of use my imagination because the lines of the sketch aren't great. They're not especially sharp. Uh, this is the kind of, I mean, this sketch was probably about that big on the page when I did the original um, line drawing and I used a, like a rubbish pen. So it's not that precise, but we're going to use it as a basis, as a guide for a much more precise piece of artwork. So I'm going to just click. So generally, my advice for using the pen tool is to click and put an anchor point at the beginning of a curve when it transitions from a straight line to a curve or between curves at the end of a curve. So there's a sort of straight line just here. We're going into a curve. So I'll put a handle down there, uh, an anchor point just there. We've got the curve. We come out of the curve into a straight line. So we put an anchor point just there. Look at that, man alive, mess. So I think that that line should have gone just there. So we're gonna go put an anchor point just there. Here, let's go in the center of this. Okay, ding, right. So let's just see how that looks without the lines. We get a much better view of whether it's a nice sort of smooth shape like this. That looks okay, it looks fine. Um, I'm gonna click A on the keyboard and make sure that I've got the direct selection tool selected. And I wanna put an extra point just there so that I can get a bit more control over the curve. Now this, uh, using the direct selection tool means that we can manipulate and adjust individual anchor points after we've drawn them. So hopefully I'll be able to sort of fuss around and make sure that these are all reasonably optimal and that they describe the shape quite nicely. I need it to have that sort of three-dimensional shape, the right sort of curves, so that it makes sense in the document in the three-dimensional shape uh, space. Okay, so that one's fine. <clears throat> now you'll notice because we've just started creating a new path, it makes a new path here in the um, paths panel, but it names that path work path, and you'll see that it's italic, which means it's kind of like a default one. Now the problem with these work paths is that once you start working a little bit more, it will just evaporate at some point, it will just disappear. I wanna be able to keep accessing this shape that I've made. So I'm gonna rename this front panel. I'm giving it a name, you'll see it's not in italics anymore. That means that this is now a component of the document and this will hang around, it, will, it won't vanish. Now I'm gonna fill this shape with, um, with a gray. So I'm going to create a new layer underneath the sketch layer, and then I'm going to call this layer front panel. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the color at the top here, I'm going to select HSB sliders. HSB is hue, saturation, brightness. I want brightness down at 50%. So we've got our exact midpoint gray. Saturation at zero, hue at zero. Um, it doesn't really matter with hue, but whatever it is, 0% saturation, because we're going to be working in gray, we're going to be playing in gray. So we'll make sure I've got 
50% grey as the foreground colour, um, in front panel as the layer, and front panel is selected as the path set just here. I'm going to hit this button at the bottom of the panel. It says fill path with foreground colour. When you smash that button, you get this. So it's filled that shape with the foreground, uh, foreground colour. Fine. And you can see that it's pretty accurate for where the shape goes. I'm going to reduce the opacity of the sketch now because what I want to do is I want to make sure that when I draw this next section, it is going to sort of line up perfectly. So actually what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw the grip at the side. So I'm going to create a new path set, which I'm going to call grip. You know, it, just on the off chance that you're a completist and you watched the session earlier today, you'll notice that I'm doing this in a ever so slightly different order. Um, not because one is right and one is wrong, but I think that doing it in this order is like 1% easier. And I'm a big fan of doing things in the easy way. You don't have to switch techniques. So I'm going to just line up here. And trace inside this line. this in a little bit. Okay, it's not, uh, it's not quite right. I'm just... Okay, so I'm going to make a new layer, which is going to be called grip. Pick a slightly different grey. Generally, when you're building up the layers like this with the individual components, you want to have a slightly different grey for each one. The reason is if they overlap or touch each other, that you can immediately see where the overlap is. If you fill everything with a 50% grey, then when they overlap, you can't see where the edge is. You can't see which one is in front of the other ones. So if there's a mistake that you've made, you can't immediately see it. So pick a different colour, fill with a 50% grey, uh, whatever colour grey, whatever colour grey you want to have, having just like said that it's not that. All right, so that looks okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill, uh, so make a, the rest of the object here. Okay, But in order to do that, I don't need to trace this edge or this edge. So we've got this top edge of the grip just here, and we've got this front edge of the front panel. Now I could try and trace those using the pen tool, but I wouldn't get it exact. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a boss at using the pen tool, but I would never get it exactly right. So the goal of what we're going to do is we're going to draw the outline exactly right and then overlap so that we can tuck this layer underneath the other two and it will inherit the front from them. So I'm going to make a new layer called body. And the goal with this is I need to match exactly this, basically where this section comes down just here. So where the top surface comes in and intersects, So I'm trying to get as good a match as I can for the uh, for these lines. But at the same time, like I said before, I'm not using these lines sort of rigidly following them. They exist as a guide to help me make my shape. So you can see I've not made any effort to hit that edge there. We're doing an overlap. So I want to make sure that the overlap is big so that there's no not overlap.
Okay, that looks about right. So now I'm going to just tack across here and close that shape. So I'm going to make a new layer called body, which is going to be underneath both of those. Body. Okay, so now you can see what I mean that my goal was to overlap. So because this is underneath these other two, if it was over the top, obviously it would be a mess. But we don't need to reproduce this front edge just here because we've already got it. So it just inherits that. So in terms of the overall broad geometry, we could just render this now and then fuss in later or with all of the details. Um, but what we're going to do instead is create the screen, the buttons, this, whatever this thing here is. But the way that I'm going to visualize this when I'm making the layers and making the mask is that if you can imagine the screen is sort of a rounded rectangle that is inset by maybe one or two millimeters, I'm going to draw the outside of the inset. So that's the top half of this double line here. And then we can, there's a technique we can use to project it back into the object. Okay, let's have a look. How does that look? Yeah, that's about right. I'm not sure what that sound effect was, but it's just the sound it makes when you do these things. So I'm going to make a new layer. Hopefully you guys, oh, I forgot to give this path a name. I'm going to call that screen. So I'm going to make a new layer, which is going to be called screen outer. And I'm going to fill it with a foreground color. OK, makes sense so far? So we've got the overall shape of the screen. But what I want is I want to have the screen as a layer as well. So in order to do that, I'm going to hold down Control and click on the thumbnail for this screen outer. So when I do that, you'll see that the thumbnail, um, the little cursor, this, this thing, has got a little marquee next to it click and it picks up the transparency as a selection. Now, I want to move that selection. I'm going to nudge it down in, wait a sec, that direction so that we can use it to select and create the screen. But if I start clicking and dragging now or using the cursor keys on the keyboard, it moves the pixels that are selected. But what I want to move is just the selection. I want to move the marquee, I want to move the marching ants, but I don't want to move um, the actual artwork. So in order to do that, you need to select a selection tool. You can do that by clicking M on the keyboard or selecting one of the marquee tools just here, M. You'll see that now the cursor is uh, got a little arrow. And next to the arrow, it's got the little dotted line indicating that what we're going to move is not the pixels, but the selection. You see that what I'm moving is the marching ants is the actual selection. So I'm going to drag that down so that it now selects the um, the screen, right? So in order to create a piece of artwork now, I need a layer that has got this edge from the selection, but this edge from the screen if that makes sense. So in order to do that, I'm going to make sure I'm on the screen outer layer, click Control C, and that will copy all of the artwork that's on that layer that's inside the selection, right? So that now has copied what I want. If I click Control V now, it will just paste it exactly in place. Now, the problem with this is it doesn't always, when you control V, it doesn't always paste exactly in place. So what I recommend instead of click, clicking control V for this, um, you can, can you tell I'm distantly surprised that that worked. 
is if you click Control Shift V, Control Shift V, and what Control Shift V does is it guarantees that it's going to paste what you've copied in exactly the same spot that you copied it. So we've now got our screen, and if I lock the transparent pixels on this, make a slightly darker selection, and flood fill, we can see now that we've got the inset as a layer and the screen as a layer. Well, hopefully that makes sense. If anyone is on the chat, either on the uh, Discord or on the YouTube chat, do me a favor just to check. Could you just post, like, first of all, that the screen, uh, the stream is working, and secondly, that you can hear me, because I've just realized that I've not done any kind of check so far. Um, we had a couple of problems earlier with the uh, stream, like the buffering went wrong and it complete, the stream completely dropped. Uh, what I suspect is that a lot of people now are doing work from home and they're doing sort of remote work. So the area that I'm in is not, I'm not in the middle of a city, I'm in a little rinky dink tin pot town and we've not got the biggest, fattest fiber optic cables that we could possibly have. It's okay, but a lot of people around here are gonna be using it, sitting watching Netflix or whatever, or getting their Disney Plus on. So um, if, <laughs> if there's any, like, if it's not working, let me know. If it's working, let me know. I'm just gonna carry on going. I'm gonna, at the end of the day, if it's not streaming properly, we'll record fine, and then you guys can have a look at it tomorrow, it's fine. Um, but it would be awesome if somebody could just be like, yes, Phil, you're not just screaming into the void. Right, here we go. Um, somebody's just said on the YouTube chat, Shift C1 not working. So, if I presume you mean um, the copy the uh, screen outer. So let me just explain. So you click M to move this, inset it down like this. So you don't click Shift C, you click Control C. If I did say, if I said Shift C, which is entirely possible, then I'm, uh, let me apologize for that. Control C. So if you click Control C, it copies what's inside the selection on that layer. Okay, so Control C hopefully will work, and then Control Shift V. So Control Shift V, that's the exact shape of that key combination, in case you were wondering. Um, um, person on YouTube who's following along, I salute you. If you let me know whether that's worked or not, um, that's ideal. But the fact that somebody's asked indicates that it probably is working, um, unless they're a powerful psychic and simply remote viewing what it is that I'm doing in the screen um, using the power of their mind. So I'm gonna do this process now. We've seen exactly how I'm gonna do it. Make a new path. Let's imagine that this is some like little indicator or some like a little cut out or an inset. Inset. Now, this morning, the way that I did this was I used the paths and I simply drew a, a an ellipse. But since it is just an ellipse, what you could also do is just use the elliptical marquee tool. And then there's a really nice setting in the bottom of the paths here, where if you click this button here, any selection that you've got, it will basically convert into paths. So I can get an ellipse that's pretty accurate. And then by clicking Control T, I can get the, um, little control handles like this. The problem actually has made a really horrible set of paths out of that, which is one of the reasons why I don't use this very often. Look at that, it's done an atrocious job. What on earth? Man alive, okay. <laughs> don't do that, just draw an ellipse. Working, right, I'm glad that that uh, worked. Thank you for letting me know. So I'm just gonna use four points to make this ellipse. 
does my nut in a little bit that it could do a better job manually drawing an ellipse. But once I've done that, I'm going to click New, Inset, Top Inset, pick a slightly darker colour, just the same. So we're just going to go through the whole image like this. So we've got our little thing up here at the top. The next bit um, is we're going to do this. These are like a little clicky buttons at the bottom of what, whatever this thing is, okay? And I'm going to create this in the same way that I did the screen. So I'm going to, if you can imagine that they're kind of inset into the object, I'm going to trace the outside of the top of the inset, and then we're going to use the exact same technique to push that sort of to extrude it into the surface. So I'm going to make a new thing here called buttons. Around these corners out. Now, this looks okay, but if we hide this, you'll see it kind of exposes one of the problems with the drawings, which is that this curve at the bottom, this line at the bottom, doesn't respect the perspective of the image. So this here, it's a real small difference, but this is this is the kind of thing that your eye just reads as wrong. This space between here and here should be minutely bigger than the space between here and here. Does that make sense? Because this is closer, so it should be essentially very narrowly tapering. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna move these ever so slightly. So that the perspective of it, of the image is still maintained. Now, the original drawing doesn't have particularly good like I said, it's not a great picture, it doesn't have a like, great perspective. But you've got to do the best that you can to make sure that the image maintains its sort of like integrity as a, a, uh, as a picture. And breaking the perspective is going to make it harder for somebody to read this picture as a 3D object. Okay, so that looks fine. Buttons. Again, I'm going to use a slightly darker colour. I'm going to make a new layer called buttons outer and flood fill with a foreground color. So that looks fine. We, we good. And it's pretty close to the it's pretty close to the sketch. So what I'm going to do is click control on the thumbnail for that layer. M, so that we're moving the selection rather than the path, or uh, rather than the pixels. I'm going to drag that down a little bit so that it's now hitting the inside. So this is the buttons now that we're, um, we're going to be uh, making. So we're on buttons outer with this selection. I'm going to click control C, so that's going to copy from the layer, then control shift V. And now we've got this, so you can see it's just this inset here. I'm locking the transparency of that layer. So now we've got the buttons looking okay. So the only remaining features that we need to put on, we've got the inset, the grip, the screen, the screen frame, the front panel, the body as a whole, these buttons, the way that we're going to do the buttons is I'm going to kind of manually draw those using the, like a slightly more basic technique that still should look okay um, and suggest what the shape is really nicely. These bits just here are kind of like an inset into the uh, shape and they look not great. So I'm going to draw a new um, path set just here which I'm going to call mic slot. Let's imagine that there's like a little microphone in there you can speak into or speak or something. And I'm going to draw one of these. So let's say it's this one here. 
I'm going to overlap with the buttons because we're going to put this layer is going to be underneath the buttons. Let me just rename that layer. Mic slot. Here we go. So click once, click drag. I'm actually going to curve this edge and we'll explain in more depth how that curve is going to work. Okay, so that's nasty as heck. I need to fix this. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's make a new layer. I'm gonna call it Mike Slot 1. Pick a nice dark color. The mic slot one needs to be underneath the buttons. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down Alt and I'm going to drag that across. And as I do so, of course, it duplicates the layer. So anytime you click with Alt held down and drag, it duplicates whatever you're moving. So I'm going to do the same one, two, three. Four. And what I need is to make sure that the spacing and the lines for these feels and looks correct. Okay. Okay, we're, we're, we're pretty good. That looks pretty good. So in order to make sure that this works properly, now I'm going to click Control E, E, E. Remember, if you have a layer selected and you click Control E, it merges that layer with the layer underneath. So now what we've got is one layer, which has got all of those details on. So what I also want is... <laughs> I want to have like an incest. If you can imagine that this is a piece of plastic, which is quite thin, which has been kind of cut through or molded through, through all the way. So underneath, there's a hole. So rather than just offsetting these, I'm going to re like constrict them. So I'm going to go to select, modify, contract, and contract them by, let's say, 10 pixels, too much. Select, modify, contract, four pixels. And so you can see what's happened is it's made a sort of a narrower shape. I'm going to click M, so I'm moving the selection. Line these up just here. And I'm going to do what I did a second ago, which is to click Control C, which is going to pick up only the bit of the bit of the mic slot which is inside the selection control c control shift v so hopefully you can see we've got this real nice like insert effect just here now so that's called mic slot cut now we're going to end up with a slightly weird effect now because um this doesn't quite visually work because the buttons, this is the edge of this surface. This surface continues along, cuts down. The buttons are cut, cut in, so it would make sense for this to cut in just there. So I'm going to unlock the transparency of the buttons layer using a small brush. So remember, you can change the size and hardness of the brush by holding down Control and Alt on the keyboard, right mouse button dragging left and right. I'm going to pick up that color from just there. I've got a opacity is set to 100%. Okay, so hopefully that will work. And I'm going to mic slot cut E. Click here, hold down shift, click over there. Okay, so that works visually for me, that's fine. 
So it's worth making a few efforts now, tweaking these bits and pieces around in order to um, get it to work. So I know that it looks like we've got one person following along. I kind of realized that we've just been through a whole load of little bits and pieces. Um, so if you want to, um, uh, if you want to give me a, a yes or like a okay or like WTF, if you get to a point <clears throat> a little bit like this, so um, I know that I can move on. I'm just going to go. I'm sitting in the shed still, and I've got the heater on. So I'm going to just go and turn the heat down a little tiny bit, guys. I'm going to be gone for a few seconds. Don't panic without me. Safe. We're back. Hopefully I'm not going to die of um, overheating in a shed. It's not the way that I want to go. Doing Photoshop in a little impromptu sauna. Right. Okay, so we're doing, I think we're doing pretty well. We've got almost all of the little bits and pieces that we need sorted out. One of the things that's missing still from this piece of artwork is we've got a bunch of shut lines which make up um, part of the artwork. So I'm going to trace those in. So I'm going to make a new layer, a uh, new path set just here, which is going to be called shut lines. So shut lines are if basically if you've got um, an object which is made up of, like I've got my little inhaler just here because of my, my duff lungs. So if we were rendering this, obviously this is made up of two different materials. And so I'm going to just describe that line just there. In this case, it's going to be our, um, our shut line. I think if there's something else that I've got around, which is a better example than that. Um, Yeah, so like if you look on the um, the headphones here, where it goes from one material to another, that line just there, as well as it's like a surface line, it's kind of like a, a line between two different pieces of molding. So we call like, think of it as being a line where it ducks in. So we're just gonna trace those ones off. P on the keyboard, press P on the keyboard. And we're gonna trace the center of those sections. So these surfaces actually, although it's got a front, a hard edge at the front, this hard edge just here is going to be radiused on the final artwork. I've got a technique, kind of one of the reasons why I want to show this session today is because I want to walk you through the technique for creating that radius. So even though we've not done a nice radius surface now, it is going to be radius at the end. So it will look nice, bear with me. So that's why I've made sure that this, as I'm tracing round, is going to be um, radius. Yes, the, the, our guy on, um, YouTube has said okay, so I'm guessing that he's caught up or has got to this point. So make sure that you've got shut lines paths just here. Um, and I'm going to just try and trace just the outlines. I'm not going to make a closed path. I just want to make sure that these um, are properly sort of represented, these different lines. This one here ducks from here. Okay, cool. Happy with that. That looks okay for me. 
and I guess the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to handle these in a different way to the way that I did it this morning. We're going to um, I'm going to put grip lines. And I'm going to just visualize what sort of the center of these little lines is going to be. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not 100% certain that this is the right way to do it. There's no, I mean, there's no right way. I think I'll be able to get the effect that I want using this. Um, I do sometimes worry when I'm doing these sessions with the, because, you know, I'm usually in the university doing these sessions. And um, a lot of the time, less so with what I'm doing today, but there's certain um, demonstrations that I do, like, regularly. So I've got a particular little wooden shape that I commonly make when I'm teaching how to do masking and, um, and, and part of the, I guess, part of the illusion to it is the first time that the students ever see me do one of these renders is usually like the sixth or seventh time that I've done it. And it might even be the second or third time that day that I've done it. So it can create this illusion that everything that you do when you're producing one of these pieces of artwork, you do unerringly and with confidence that it's the right thing every single time. Whereas the reality is that when I'm actually working uh, commercially, although I've got a load of techniques that I know are going to work, quite often there will be um, like an element of experimentation in almost every single part of the way that I'm working. So if I'm going to be applying a technique to a particular layer, often I will, the first thing I'll do is duplicate that layer. So if it doesn't work, I don't have to go back through the history. I can just delete that and work on the original layer. So a lot of the way that I work is built around working in an experimental way. And I do worry slightly sometimes that in my, because I, obviously I want to have a great deal of authority when I'm teaching because I want people to believe that what I'm doing is the right way to do it so that they can follow along. But the reality is that it's only become the right way of doing by having done it experimentally a number of different times and then gone, okay, yeah, that's the right way of doing it. So for example, if you watch both of the tutorials that I've done today, this one and the one that I did in the morning, my way of attacking this drop document is slightly different in each one. And they both have their strengths, but they also will both have their weaknesses. So um, this method that I'm gonna eventually unpack for doing this grip just here, I'm not 100% certain it will work. If it does work, it will be easier than the way that I tried to do it earlier. Um, if it doesn't work, then in a way I've wasted a bit of time, but then I always have the fallback of doing it the other, the other way. Uh, I'm not, I hope that makes sense. Um, and I hope that that little peek behind the curtain hasn't spoiled the illusion too much. So the important thing is that we've got to this stage of the artwork. So we've got quite a nice um, sort of 3D look to our shape. But of course, there's absolutely no um, depth or dynamism to any of the individual surfaces because we've not actually done any of the render. All we've done is we've built all of the masks. And this way of working is based on actually a traditional airbrushing method where you would make all of these masks by literally knifing out a piece of um, like a huge red roll of acetate. Each of these shapes you would knife out using an actual knife. And then after you've made all of the different masks, you go in with the airbrush and you actually produce the render, you produce the artwork. So we're at the point now where we've kind of done all of the knifing out of the red stuff. And what we're gonna do is, in my opinion, the interesting bit, the fun bit, where we're gonna use the airbrush to uh, create this depth. So we're gonna go and select all of the geometry layers that we've made so far. We're gonna make sure that they have all got the transparency lock on because the way that we're gonna work is now that we've defined the outline of these shapes really precisely, pixel precise, using the paths, we're gonna use the airbrush to paint inside those layers. So when you lock the transparency like this, when you paint on that layer, it doesn't add or remove any pixels. It doesn't make any pixels more opaque or more transparent. All it does is it changes the colors of the pixels that are already there. So that means that we can paint inside these shapes and the silhouette of the shapes, which so far defines a three-dimensional shape, is gonna be respective. So click B on your keyboard, B stands for brush, if you remember. 
I'm going to make sure that we've got, um, let's say we've got front panel, which is this um, top section selected. Control and Alt on the keyboard. When you hold those down, I wasn't doing a signal then, I was just, this is the mouse hand that I've got. You hold those down here, right mouse button. Remember, left and right increases and decreases the size of the brush. Up and down increases and decreases the opacity of the brush, uh, um, the hardness of the brush, sorry. So push all the way up and you get a 0% hardness brush, which is what we want. When you notice, I'm using a huge brush. And that's because when you're working using an airbrushing technique like this, the bigger the brush you get, then the more um, the like the more smooth the effect that you're going to get is. Students I see often use a smaller brush, and it looks whack because it, yeah they have to sort of scrub backwards and forwards. And instead of getting this beautiful gradient, which is what you want, you get this sort of like b -b 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 like little individual pieces striations, and it looks messy. Um, sometimes, just to double check, if you're working with a soft edge brush, you want to make sure that your spacing is set at 25%. Just hit this button just here. Make sure spacing is set at 25%. If it's too low, you end up with a very dense brush, which you can't get a nice smooth gradient with. If it's too high, you get this sort of caterpillar effect. So you want about 25%. <coughs> Excuse me. 25%, there we go, let's get rid of that. Now, on the keyboard, I'm going to click D. Now what D does is D is the default colors and you'll see here we've got black as the foreground, white as the background. So that means that when we start painting we can paint in black and if you press X on the keyboard, X swaps them over, that's how I remember it swaps the colors over. So you press X and you've got white now so that you can be painting with white. Now if I started painting now it would be too strong. We'll just straight away put black down because the opacity for the brush is set at 100. What I want to do is I want to reduce that all the way down so that it's at 10% because by using 10% of very low opacity soft edge brush, you can gradually build up your gradient bit by bit by bit and it looks really nice and organic. So you don't have to click at the top and drag and make sure that you've got it set at 10%. The way to do it is that you just press the number on the keyboard that you want. So I want 10%, I'm going to press one on the keyboard. If you look up here at where the opacity is when I press one, boom, it goes to 10%. If you want 50%, you can press 5 and it will jump to 50%, 70%, 7. If you want a, a, um, a specific unit integer, if you want 23%, you just put 2, 3. You won't ever want 23%. So I'm just going to press 1 again because I want to build this up bit by bit. So I've got front panel, transparency locked. And so when I start painting on this layer, I can get this real nice gradient that goes across that layer. So I want to make sure that it feels light and we've got this gradient going from the back to the front here. Now the reason why I'm doing this rather than using the gradient tool is because when you use the gradient tool you have to set it up, you have to know ahead of time how you want that to look and I didn't know how I wanted that to look. I don't still really know how bright I want it to be at the back at the front and how bright at the back because I'm going to have to um, I'm going to have to adjust that on the fly. So this is a more organic way of working. Much easier because it relies on you looking at it and going, that's wrong, or that's right, if that makes sense. Let me just switch this light. So now I've done that, I'm going to reduce the size of the brush, click on body, and I'm going to use a smaller brush to add some shading to that body side. So I want the front bit to be darker than the back bit. I want there to be sort of a catch light like this coming up from the surface underneath. If you guys who are um, in my class, if you remember like our potato exercise, um, I realized to everybody else that sounds like I'm sort of making stuff up, but we do an exercise where we render a sphere using a particular method and then this sort of like freeform shape, which is a sort of slightly potato-y. So you've got to imagine that although we've got this um, flat surface at the top, that this is kind of that potato. Now we've gone to a lighter edge just here so that it communicates that we're going around this curve just here, but I actually need this to be darker than this front, this top surface so that it still feels like this is um, perpendicular on top of it. And it's those transitions between different edges and the different brightnesses 
that's going to tell a story about what shape this object is. Okay, fine. So this has got some three-dimensional shape down here. Maybe not, I'm not loving it up the side just here. Here. Okay, fine. I'm going to render the grip, and I want that to be darker than the um, uh, plastic side of this object. But still with this sort of light, so that it feels like it's got a bit of a catch underneath it, so that the environment is reflecting on it. Okay, that's getting somewhere. So we've got much stronger sense of three-dimensional depth now. The um, screen outer, if we're going to imagine that the light is coming down from slightly behind the object, wait, behind the object, up like in that corner, so the light's coming down, so it's going to cast a shadow onto this surface just here. So this surface needs to be much darker than the surface behind it. And I need to emphasize that across here, but I'm also going to have like a, a light just here to suggest that as it curves round, it's catching the light just there. And we will put a kind of highlight across the front in a second. The screen itself, I want to have a real dark gradient across so that it's darker than everything. So it's definitely going to be darker than the shape, uh, this, the shape behind it. And there's a little trick for making this look like it is an actual reflective screen. You put a diagonal across it like this, B, X so that we paint in white, low opacity, and that's it. Um, it's just the simplest, cheapest cheat of a trick. And yet, it just works to create that sense of being a sort of a reflective screen. But the reason is, what that is that you're looking at is if you can imagine that we've got a like a rectangular soft light box on top of it, or, or like a, in the space above the object, this diagonal edge here, you're looking at the reflection of the edge of the soft box. So the light bit is the soft box, and then the black bit, which you can, I'm one point of the screen, you can see my finger. The, the, the black bit here is the bit past the soft box. So for whatever reason, that is just, it's like a really nice effective visual shorthand for that being a sort of a high gloss reflective screen. Now I did mention that I was gonna try and put a, a highlight in front of it. So th there's a trick to doing this. So I'm gonna duplicate the screen outer layer, which I'm gonna call screen outer highlight. So what I'm gonna do with this is I've put that underneath the screen outer. So I've got that layer is another layer. I'm gonna use the keys on the keyboard, the cursor keys to just nudge it down and to the right a little tiny bit. So you can see now that there's actually a very few, quite a fine sort of line just there. We've still got the transparency lock for it. I'm gonna click B, so I've got white. And now if I paint over that, so that it goes white, lighter than the um, surface in front of it. We get this real nice highlight just on this front edge that lifts the edge up. And you can always, if you've gone to pure white with that, just reduce the opacity so that you feel like it works. But you can see that now we've got this edge just here that indicates you're sort of looking over the bit where it dips down, if that makes sense. 
Nice. So now we've got the inset for the buttons. So I'm going to select um, buttons outer. Again, dark color. Let's just reduce the opacity. That's it. There's not a lot to it. I just need it to be darker than the background. But now I'm going to use this as the bit that's going to take a little bit longer. So you guys are going to have to bear with me for a second. I need to render the um, just the buttons as though it were a single surface. So that the default for it is that it's got a sensation of depth. And then we can add additional depth then. And it makes it look more nice. Nicer. So what I'm going to do very low opacity. Drag a line across there, line across there. So it feels like it's got some kind of depth at least. So now what I'm going to do, let's just reduce the opacity of this right down so I can see. I can see it, but I don't need to, it to really overwhelm the artwork. I'm going to reduce the um, size of the brush and increase the hardness of the brush to 100%. I'm going to set black as a foreground color. And I want to draw on the buttons layer a line that goes across like that. So click one point, one end, hold down shift click at the other end. Okay, so we've got our center line for the buttons here. Reduce the size down even more. Click here once, hold down shift, click just here. So we've got our lines across. Uh-oh, we've just got the little yellow box up here on the YouTube streaming thing, which means that there's quite a solid chance that at some point in the immediate future, the uh, stream is gonna like have some kind of skep and we're gonna have uh, an issue. So I'm just gonna apologize. If we drop off the network, then I will should be back on within about five minutes. So don't bail out, don't pull the ripcord, don't eject out of this stream, okay? Just listen to it for a couple of minutes. And then when we come back, you'll hear more blather, okay? We sh we'll see, we should be fine. I just don't want to panic about it. So now we've got this cross line in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the polygonal lasso tool. So we could use masks and the um, pen tool to select this, but I, it doesn't really need it because it's so simple. So I'm going to click here and click here. And I'm just kind of selecting that Bit that's going to be facing most towards the light. Now I'm going to hold down shift on the keyboard and shift remember adds to the selection. So if I select that just there that's added to that selection. Hold down shift again, draw over here and that adds that to that selection. So I'm going to click B, large soft edge brush, white, reduce the opacity down to 10% again. Make sure that there's some kind of like dynamism in these flat surfaces. So even though they're flat, they're still going to have a gradient across them. So show where they're catching the light. So I reckon that looks pretty good. So now we're going to do the exact same thing over here. Click once, twice. So we're selecting just these side pieces. And remember, because we are masked inside the layer, I don't need to be maximum careful about um, how the selection works. B again, this time not quite so bright. So I think that looks quite nice. Let's just select the bottom sections, one, two, three, four, like that. And then this bit here. X, so we're going to paint black. Paint that shadow in. So I think we've got quite a nice effect of that sort of prismatic, sort of little pyramidical buttons. I'm not sure that that's a kind of, I'm not sure that that's a button that anyone has, 
um, but at least it looks nice. Now I'm just going to manually paint in a little bit of shadow around the outside. That looks good. I'm also going to, and this is a slightly odd one, I'm going to reduce down the B, reduce down the size of the brush, hard edge again, real small brush, X on painting white, reduce the opacity to the lowest, 10%, and then each one of these lines, I'm going to run a white line up. So even these front lines here. So what that does is it helps just it just lifts these lines up, makes it very clear that they are sort of like mounting folds that are coming towards you. And it just adds a little extra lift to them. So what I want is for them to feel sort of very like sharp and angular and for them to pop really nicely. Just put a little highlight at the top, a little highlight just here. I'm also going to use this brush to paint a highlight line across here so that it's very clear that this is a separate button with a front edge there that's catching the light. I'm going to put a real fine dark line in across here from here to here. That's a white line. Get it together, Phil. Just to make a very hard de delineation. So that looks real sharp now. That detail looks real sharp. So I'm happy with that. Just going to reduce the opacity down, add a little extra sort of shadow on here. Okay, happy with that. These little sections just here, this needs some rendering still. So that's that main slot just there. The cutout just needs to go to full black. And the mic slot, let's reduce the opacity here. It needs to be sort of darker than this um, base section just here. And then go to a light like this. If that makes sense. So that it's obvious that this is a curve. It's a curve. And it's picking up some of the light. And it's let's just do this, see if this works. Does that work? Two hard edge. Yeah, that looks okay. So the other thing that we can do, now that we've got the button outer done, is we can create a highlight exactly the same as this highlight that we use for the screen. So let's go click on buttons, outer, duplicate that, drag that under, buttons, outer, highlight, I'm going to call it. Let's see if I can type correctly, highlight, yep, I do know how to spell words, good like that. V, so that we're moving the actual layer. Fill with white, alt backspace. And I can just 
reduce the opacity slightly. Yeah. That looks good. So we've got this nice sharp edge just here. Nice edge just here. This little doobie doops up here, top inset. Very easy to render. Soft edge brush, low opacity. Paint the highlight in. It's got to be lighter than this surface to indicate that it's painting, uh, pointing closer to the, the light source. And this just needs to be darker so that it's indicating that it's pointing away from the light source. That's fine. So it's got this nice sort of feeling of being a, like a little scoop out. So we're looking pretty good. The grip, I'm going to paint a nice white highlight across the top of this. And the way to do this is like this. You click Control on the grip. M, so we're moving the um, the selection, because what I want is for there to be a highlight that exactly follows this top surface. So I'm going to use the cursor keys on the keyboard to nudge that across like this. So you can see that this is exactly parallel now, because the top of the selection is exactly the same shape as the um, line just here. But if I start painting now, it's only going to paint inside the selection. But I don't want to paint in that very narrow this very narrow section here, right? So in order to make sure that we're painting outside of the selection, if we've got the selection here, I'm gonna to go to Select, Inverse. And so you can see now that we've got the marching ants around the outside of the artboard and here, which means that when we start painting, it's only gonna paint outside the selection, which means it's only gonna paint inside on this layer, this bit just here. So increase the size of the brush, increase the opacity, and we get this quite nice smooth kind of a highlight there. So we've actually got a really strong sense of three dimensionality for this object. Now it's taken not a huge amount of time. The idea is that it's quite a fast way of doing this. Um, if you had infinite amount of time then you could sit and maybe produce like a nice CAD render out there. But to go from a, a, a crappy sketch like the one that we had to something like this in um, about one hour, 25 minutes with gas. Like if I was working like this um, without having to explain any of the steps that I was on, I, you just have to take my word for it. I'd be able to do this a lot faster. You really slow me down, you know that. So there's a few more little bits that I want to do. If we go down here, we have got these grip lines again. So. What I'm going to do with these is, we're going to go through a bit of a weird process. I'm going to create a brush that is, if I was going to just, with a pen, just draw these now, if I was just going to click and draw this line here, how thick would that be? So I'd want it to be hard edged because they're kind of molded in. Um, and I'd want them to be around about, we could just look at the sketch. Yeah, they're around about that thickness, right? Maybe a little bit smaller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the quick mask just here. Now quick mask is a special parallel universe mode for Photoshop where when you paint instead of painting colors, it lets you paint a selection basically. So I'm going to, but you have to do it in a particular way. So the default is when you, I want you guys just to double click on this. Your default, probably on your machine, it will say color indicates masked areas. We want it to be the exact other way around. So I need you to select selected areas. Okay, and the reason for that is, so say we start painting now inside um, in quick mask mode. So let's just scribble, scribble, scribble. You see that it's painting red because that's the quick, quick mask uh, color. When we come out of quick mask, which you can do by clicking Q on the keyboard, where we had painted red is now selected. And what's cool is if I start painting now, it will only paint inside the areas where I've said we're going to paint. Does that make sense? Deselect. So I'm going to select, I've got a 100% opacity brush. I've got the right size brush. I've got grip lines selected. I'm going to go into quick mask and I'm going to press this button at the bottom of the paths uh, panel, right? So this one here. And what this does is it draws a line using whatever your brush is that you've got now over the paths. And because we're in quick mask, when we pop out of quick mask, 
those sections are selected. So what I can do now is I can paint. So let's just deselect that. I can paint into those areas like this. which lets us create quite a nice sort of feeling for how we want the um, these lines to work. So let me just hide the sketch. The problem with this is that the, um, the sketch layer kind of makes it hard to see what we're doing. So I'm gonna just kind of shade in a little bit so we can get a nice feeling of depth for these. So they look like they've sort of worked reasonably well. I think it's got that kind of right side, right side kind of feeling. What it doesn't do is, is it doesn't the it doesn't duck in just here the way that it should, because if those are molded in, then obviously we would see some kind of ducking just there. So I'm gonna unlock the transparency, use the, the eraser, and literally just manually Do that ducking in just there. So, eh, no, not quite perfect. I think perhaps if I spent a little bit longer making sure that they were drawn in properly, it would have been maybe more effective. But not terrible. I'm not. It's not a. It's not a car crash, so that's fine. But of note, let me just relock that. Of note is that. Um, yeah, that's not how I would do that again. But what? It's fine. It's fine. I can use that exact same technique that we did. If I visualize what the um, shirt lines are going to look like, so I'm going to make a new layer, which is going to be, um, let's move the screen layers up to the top. And this layer is going to be above buttons outer, but underneath the buttons. And I want it to be above the screen outer as well. So let's make a new layer called shut lines. So again, I'm going to, let's just get close to this. I'm going to work out what the line would be. If I was going to just straight up paint these shut lines, what would that line look like? So 100%. Four pixels. You have to be pixel precise with this. I normally wouldn't normally pick a pixel size, but let's let's just do it just for now. So I'm gonna go into Quick Masks Q, smash the um, create strokes from paths button, drop back out of Quick Masks. Let's just get out of there. There. 
make sure that I'm on the shut lines layer. Now I'm going to use a large soft brush with a low opacity just to paint the shut lines in. Now if you have a painting inside selections like this and you don't want to see the selections, if you click Control H, it hides the selections but keeping them extant, so they still exist. You just can't see them. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to see this bit just here, buttons hour. Um, let's just edit this a little bit. Okay, so that looks about right. So we've still got this selected, which is perfect. If I click M, I'm going to just nudge it down and to the right so that there's actually basically no overlap. Now if I use a large light brush, I can paint these really nice highlights in. So the line sort of makes sense. This bit here is a bit weird. It's just M. Z. All right, M, let's just shuffle that across. B. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So we've got our shut lines, we've got all of our shading done. It looks quite nice. I'm happy with this, how it's going so far. Let's say, for example, though, that I did not want a hard edge just here. In fact, it doesn't make sense for there to be a hard edge just there because we've actually got curves just here and curves just here. So how, now that I've rendered this as a hard edge between here and here, Am I going to make it so that it's a nice soft edge? Well, fortunately, there's a really easy technique for doing this. So I'm going to go to front panel and body. So this is these two layers, this layer here, this layer here. And I'm going to duplicate them so that we've got front panel copy, body copy. And I'm going to merge them together, merge layers. So now we've got this one layer, which has got both of them on it. So front panel copy, I'm going to rename that whole object. Can spell. It's one of my strengths. I'm going to lock the transparency for this. And remember, locking the transparency, what that means is it won't add or remove any um, pixels. It will only change the pixels that already exist. So we're not going to adjust the silhouette of this shape, but we can adjust the shape inside. So if we go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, the radius here radiuses this front edge. So we get this really cool effect where we can decide by literally just adjusting this radius here on the board, on the thing, whether we go from something that's really sort of like a pebble and organic shaped to something that's got quite a, like a broad radius to something that's got a very tight radius like this. It's an absolutely brilliant technique because it gives you this moment of super duper control. Super duper control, Jesus Christ. Do you even think about what you're saying before it comes out of your mouth though? And the answer is of course, no. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the way that I've made the curve look and pick a radius that suits it. There we go, that one looks pretty good. So we've got this nice sort of flowing edge now. So this is a technique that you can use anywhere that you've got um, something that you want to uh, add a bit of a blur to, um, radius slightly. So for the grip here, for example, if we add that same Gaussian blur to that, then we get this much more like loose shape than the one that we've got. So we just add a slight Gaussian blur to it. Maybe that will work. I quite like that. So we've still got this real nice sharp edge, but then we've got a slight blur. So it's a really nice, um, it's a nice detail because this this blur, I mean that blur combined with those super precise 
curtains there is really like a compelling feature in terms of making it feel like it's a three-dimensional shape. Anyway, hype over for that particular technique. So I'm going to make sure that I save this, Control S, sensor device, PM. Normally, if you're working on a real project, you should be saving a little bit more frequently than this, but I'm just trying to uh, keep everything moving. Cool, everything seems to be going okay. There's going to be a brief disruption in a second because a bunch of kids are going to come back from school, and it is, of course, their last day of school before isolation. So I'm going to make one more feature here. Sometimes if you're working, you'll see people who are working with like Sketchbook Pro or something like that will do like these big broad sweeps of highlights that makes it feel really organic. The problem is I'm using my graphics tablet. Um, yep. Great. <laughs> I'm using my graphics tablet. So I could probably do that using the tablet. But you might not be using a graphics tablet. Sometimes you can have to do it a few times, and you might want to make it respect the exact sort of like front curve of this object. So I'm going to put a nice sweeping highlight on here, and I'm going to use the exact same technique that we just used a moment ago. So I'm going to make a new layer above, um, let's say just below the shut lines layer. I'm going to call it sweep. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the path set just here, which has got this front line on, front panel. B, I'm going to print, make the um, select the size of the brush that I would use for this. And we should be able to make it really nice and precise. So I'm going to, it's about the brush that's about the size of that radius. Q to go into um, quick mask. 100% opacity for the brush. And what we're doing is we're going to use this click that button there, make a path around, a stroke around the outside of the path. And now we can paint, when we come out of the quick mask, we can paint using a big soft edge brush inside that selection. So let's just... So we've been able to paint inside that selection. In fact, let's just put the sweep underneath the mic slots. There we go. Which lifts this front edge up a huge amount. It looks so nice. So we've got this nice organic shape just here. And we've got the overall outline of the object. We've got our um, grip just here. A nice, like a glossy screen, which is going to work against. Um, everything else. So we've got the geometry of this object complete. So I'm going to select all of these bits and pieces. I'm going to just stick them into a folder which is called geometry. And this is the best way of doing this is once you've got your geometry set up, you just bundle it all together into one spot. And we're going to um, add some texture to this. I found a really nice, uh, where are we going? Bing, a nice ABS plastic texture earlier on. ABS plastic texture. The reason for searching in Bing, guys, if you remember, is because you get to pick more specifically like what size things are going to be. It was this texture just here. If you search here, you'll be able to see the exact same thing. Literally just going to copy that image, paste it directly into Photoshop, and then I can click um, Overlay to make sure that it's the right dimensions. Desaturate, take the color away. And I actually want to shrink it down because it's not quite the right size. The one that I did today wasn't quite right, it's not quite the right size. And we also want to make sure that the peak is at 50%. So that it's not really lightening or darkening the texture underneath. Once I've got that, I'm going to click. So I've selected it, edit, define pattern. Okay, edit. Define pattern, ABS2, because I did one this morning. So let's call that plastic texture. Select everything, F uh, edit, fill, nope. Edit, fill, pattern, there we are. 
So you can see it just happens that it's a tiling texture. So we just worked out okay like this. If you watch Tuesday's session, I teach in both of those videos how to make a tiling texture. So if you're not sure about that, um, just jump on there and watch. So we click, make sure that we've got the transparency mode set to overlay. You see we've got this lovely texture now. Let's just sharpen that. Mint. Obviously I don't want it to apply to everything. So I'm just gonna pick up the outlines from these layers here and create a layer mask. So all I did then guys, hold down control, click on the first one, control shift, click on the next, control shift, click on the next. You see that it selects all of them. Make sure that you've got the plastic texture layer selected. And I kind of want to remove the buttons and the screen from this. I'm going to hold down Control and Alt, remove the buttons and remove the screen. Where has the screen gone? Oh, it's that idiot. So now when I click layer mask, we get it applied only to the bits that I think should be made out of this material. Probably, maybe not the grip, I don't know. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna remove the grip from that selection. Uh, and then I'm gonna create a hue and saturation layer mask, colorize, pick a nice color for that. That'll do, that's looking good. Yeah, there we go, that'll do. So we've got nice texture, bit of color. I could go in and add a whole load of other textures and stuff. It's not really necessary for what we're doing, I don't think, but I think you guys get the idea. I'm actually gonna put those two into a folder called materials. And there's one more thing in terms of the actual shape of the object. If you notice that on the original sketch, we've got these, which are, I guess, screws. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add, oh, thank you, somebody on the, the uh, person who's following along on YouTube said it looks great. I appreciate it. I think hopefully yours is looking pretty pang too. I'm gonna go on to Bing. I'm gonna put, sheesh. Screw recessed screw head flat screw head flat cross head screw right and what I'm looking for is a sort of a, a decent photograph at the right angle flat oh hex a screw maybe would work hex a screw So that it's very, I want one that's dead straight upright so that I can just make a real easy selection so it's easier to do because I'm, look, I'm lazy. Now it's just usually that if the if there is one that exists that's at the right angle, then it makes sense to use one that's dead square rather than um, one that's at a wonky angle. So it looks like I'm being a bit fussy but the reality is I'm just trying to save myself a little bit of time. Uh, no, not quite. So as with all of these things, you guys hopefully will be able to get the idea of the way that we're working. We could have simply um, made a selection and just like created the screw head like this. So let me just, I'm gonna, let me see if I can find one that's more upright than that. It's actually at a wonky angle. It's, the thing is it's relatively easy for me to do. Well, that's the one from earlier, that's cheating. 
it's easy for me to do, but I don't want to leap in and do a slightly more difficult technique that doesn't really make sense for you guys. There we go, that one's okay. So what I want is to be able to just hold down Alt with the elliptical marquee tool and just select just the head of the screw like this. Control C, Control V, so I've got that on its own layer. I'm going to duplicate that so that I'm going to work with the duplicate layer. Screw head. And I want to get it so that the angle for the ellipse is about right and the size is about right. So the minor axis of the ellipse, which is the short axis, needs to be pointing sort of in the perspective direction, which is about there. So those two look about right. Just because this section over here is at a, a different angle, I have to do this one slightly differently. So I realize I feel like a bit, I've run out of things to say because all we're doing is just like shuffling teeny tiny pixel bits around. But hopefully yours is starting to look pretty good too. I'm gonna to flatten them all down onto one layer called screw head. Because they're sort of photographic detail, they look quite nice usually and it will lift the artwork a little bit, sharpen them so that they jump. Now, I want them also to have um, a feeling of being slightly recessed into the uh, shape, the, um, Heavens above, get there, Phil, into the plastic. So I'm going to click on FX, layer effects. I'm going to select bevel and emboss. And the embossing that we want to have is you guys are going to want to have outer bevel, low depth. It's got to be down. And you want the light to be coming from the right angle for this piece of artwork. Let's have chisel hard to see if that makes a difference. Okay. Increase the depth. So you're going to have to sort of juggle some of these bits about. I think that works okay. So the artwork itself is nice. I'm going to stick that in materials inside that folder. The artwork itself looks nice. I'm going to make a new layer behind everything. Fill it with white, I'm going to call that white BG. So we've got our white background. Now if this was a piece of um, commercial photography, often this would be done using, I mean we've already established that we've got a sort of a, a light box just here. So perhaps we would have one of these sort of like paper backdrops. So in order to simulate that, I'm going to put a gradient behind just here. So it's going to lift this out a little bit. And I'm going to put a shadow so that it feels like it's sort of like floating in space like a piece of photography might be. And I've got a little bit of a trick for doing the shadow. I'm going to reduce the brush size down. Big soft edge brush still, 100% opacity this time. Did I press that? Yeah, 100% opacity. Let's just hide these. So let me explain this. I'm going to just click once with 100% opacity and we get our big sort of ghostly smoggy blob like this. Click Control T. I'm holding down Shift so that it flattens it out. And you basically just position your dark blob underneath the base of the object like this. And it just looks like the shadow for the object. So I think that we've we've done it. Um, there's a, I could sit here for another like two three hours, 
just like pushing pixels about and like making small adjustments and adding and taking little bits away, like creating some kind of depth of field or putting some like a, a little bit of a catch light on the back. But the reality is anything that you do at this point, um, you need to be, you need to have a cutoff point. I'm not going to sit here and spend like the rest of the day dragging you guys through some kind of torturous tutorial. If you've got this far, right, give yourselves a pat on the back, give yourselves a, a like a hygiene high five and um, congratulate yourselves on having done something that looks pretty dope. Um, as ever, this would exist for a reason rather than just to look slick and suave. You've got to communicate to somebody what the object is like. This is a great way of visualizing um, material expression. So if you've got loads of different materials, you can make textures using the tutorial that I showed you guys before. I might split that out and just do a real quick tutorial another time. It's a good way to um, explore different colorways and the way that you can break an object up because we have breaking up the object into all of its component surfaces anyway. So when you're building masks to make the different colors, it's trivial to sort of approach those um, masks differently. When I've done this before, we've used like a nice brushed aluminium texture for the little buttons on it so that they rhyme with the um, uh, screws that we've used. We've used the ABS texture for the rubber grip at the back and it kind of reads as rubber because it's like a different color from the other bits. It's <laughs> 70% high five. Do you know what? 70% is pretty flipping good. Uh, and if you look at the work that you've got, so what I like to do sometimes when I've gone, we've just gone from this to that. And if you're 70% of the way from that to there, I reckon that's going to be pretty flipping good. Um, the other thing that you can do sometimes, uh, like I mentioned before, is I've I've done this already, <laughs> already once today, and I've done it a few times in the past. Um, and I've used the pen tool a lot in the past, so I'm familiar with making these extremely accurate masks. But if your masks aren't accurate, and you have got like a wonky outlines around the outside, it doesn't quite look perfect, you're not quite happy with it, if you drop the sketch lines back on, those sketch lines will cover up a lot of the inaccuracies and it still reads as the material, it still reads with a three-dimensional depth, but you have this sort of slightly more immediate feel of it being sort of informal and being a sketch. And so that can cover up a lot of the um, um, issues. The other thing that you can do, if you feel like this looks too bold, if you take the sketch and you reduce the opacity down, you get this sort of like halfway sketch render. And what I find is, when I first started off doing this, I would be up here with 100% sketch and I was always colouring in the sketch. And then gradually as I got more comfortable with it, you can reduce down the sketch. And now my goal is to be able to produce something that doesn't use the sketch um, and still looks like it sort of, it has depth, it has presence. And, and I think most people would read that as being at least a CAD picture rather than just something that we cooked up in Photoshop on the, on the back of a pretty bad sketch. So I'm going to wrap this up now, guys. Um, I'm not sure. I feel like one person has come with me live on the journey. Um, and uh, because I can't read the characters that you've used to write your name with, I'm afraid I can't say thank you for coming along. But you know who you are. Um, and I want to um, salute you. Thanks for um, following the program. Good luck with all of your endeavours. And I will see you guys Next time we do another one of these tutorials, I think we're going to be hitting some more on Tuesday because normally I'd be in uni on Tuesday. So we're going to be looking at some more stuff on there. If, like I said, you guys have got any questions about any of the stuff that we've covered in the session today, you can just ask those down in the comments below when you're watching this back later on, even if it's a week, two weeks, a month later. I'm always going to have like um, my YouTube notifications on, so I should be able to, even if there's a bit of a delay, drop in and answer any of those questions. If you're one of my students at the university or from the university, if you guys want to um, ask me anything more specific about the course, you can always ask me on the Discord channel. You guys have got my um, uh, you guys have got my email address usually. I think there's a, a Facebook group that we could go on anyway. So that's it. I'm going to click the end stream button, but um, make sure you guys stay safe, and I will see you again soon. Practice all of your Photoshop and drawing and stuff, and hopefully we'll get spat at the end of this coronavirus experience and we'll all be much better at drawing and doing Photoshop. That's the goal. That's the dream. I'll see you there. Bye.